Today we will be covering how to use scenes and cues in MadMapper to program a show with a fine degree of control. Through a series of examples, I'll demonstrate what scenes and cues are, what they can do, and the difference between the two. I will then walk through three example cases where scenes and cues might be used in a projection mapping project. In this case, the project will be projection mapping a five-tier wedding cake. I'm using a demo version of MadMapper 3.6, which can be downloaded for free from MadMapper's website. I'd encourage you to do the same and follow along with this tutorial. One of several limitations of the demo is a watermark over the output window. Scenes and cues live down here in the queue bank. If you can't see this area, come up here to queues and toggle on show queue bank. We'll start by talking about scenes and then moving on to cues. Scenes take a snapshot of all MadMapper settings. They record the state of your project at the time the scene was made, and therefore will not show any surfaces you create or settings you change after the time the snapshot was made, unless you update the scene. Scenes occupy the top row of the grid and are partitioned off from the queue area by this thicker line. Let's make a surface assign it a material, customize it a little by changing scale, speed, and front color in the materials parameters on the right. We might also change the surfaces parameters on the left by flipping it, for example. If we create a scene by hitting a plus icon in this top row, every value associated with this project, from the surfaces to the materials and everything else, is stored in this scene and can be reinstated by triggering this scene. We can show this by changing the scale, speed, and color. We could even move the existing surface, add another surface and position it alongside and give that some customization. But if we hit play on our scene, we go back to how things were when we took the snapshot. Notice triggering the scene will hide any surfaces you made after the scene's creation. You can also trigger a scene by clicking the number at the top of the column. If we want to make changes, we can store them in another scene. For example, let's change the speed and color, flip the surface and move it, and then store our new arrangement in a new scene in column two. Now we can access these two unique setups whenever we trigger these scenes. If we want to make a change, perhaps we feel like the speed in this second scene is a little too fast, we can adjust the value and then right click on the scene and select update scene. The changes will now be stored in that scene. To stay organized, we might change the color of the grid box to remind ourselves of what the scene contains. We might also want to rename them. It's not necessarily practical for us to manually trigger these each time. We want to set up some form of automation. This is done via the autoplay settings. Here we can say that we want our media to play for five seconds before moving on to the next column. If we were setting our show to music, we could specify the duration in beats per minute. You can also tell MadMapper that if it's dealing with a movie, i.e. a video file, it should move on only when the video is complete. We'll be using this later. But for now, we're happy having set the duration to five seconds. We want our show to loop left to right, so we're happy to leave this as it is. We might also want one scene to gently fade into the other rather than change abruptly. We set that here either by double clicking where it says fade or hitting the cog and entering a value in the duration. I'll set one second for both. Now if we hit the play button, we should see the behavior we programmed. Hit the play button again to stop it. Maybe we want to go one step further and decide that even though we want our media to fade over one second, we want the fade of the color to take place over a longer period of time. You can do this by finding the parameter in the inspector on the right. Here we can see the green color we set for our second scene. We can change it from use Q transition settings, which we know we've set to one, to use local transition settings instead and set this to four. Now, even though most of the parameters transition over one second, the color change takes place for longer, over four seconds. 
So if scenes are this powerful, what are cues for? What's the difference between a cue and a scene? When you create a scene, it stores everything, all settings. You cannot remove entries from a scene and you cannot only store certain parameters within it. You store everything. Therefore, a scene is limited in its ability to be edited. Scenes were brought in with MadMapper 3.5 to replace the presets feature of previous MadMapper versions. And that's a helpful way to look at the function of scenes. Think of scenes like presets for commonly used setups that you might want to repeatedly return to or do a wholesale reset back to. They are like Basecamp, upon which you build up increasing levels of customization using cues which allow you to fine-tune your show. Cues live down here in the queue grid, below the first row where the scenes are stored. You can scale the view to suit the number of cues you have with these icons here. Cues allow you to control parameters separately, which gives you much more granular control. Let's create a surface and set it to green in its surface parameters by pulling down the red and blue values. Drag it into a queue. Because it's a queue and not a scene, we have only recorded these values over here, the ones associated with the surface, none over here on the right to do with the material. We can demonstrate this by changing the color in the surface's parameters and changing the scale in the material's parameters and triggering the queue. The material resets to green because that was the color information stored in the queue. However, the scale stays the same because there are no media parameters stored in the queue to overwrite what we just set. It can be difficult to remember what you've stored inside a queue. That's where edit mode comes in. It highlights in bright red what information has been stored inside a queue or a scene. Here we can see clearly how scenes store all information and queues are able to store just some. We can edit cues in edit mode by shift clicking a parameter to change the value that's stored. We can also create new cues using edit mode. We select inside a grid space, click a parameter so it is stored inside the queue. This makes it turn red. Then we shift click to set the value of that parameter. You do not need to click update values when working like this in edit mode. Something to note about the relationship between scenes and cues in the grid is that scenes take priority over cues. For example, in our first column, our scene is programmed to show green. If we go into edit mode and change this cue to show red whilst holding down shift and then trigger the column, the green takes precedence because it is set by the scene. The yellow signifies that what's being shown is not the value stored in the cue. In other words, that some form of overwriting is taking place. There can be advantages to splitting out the parameters into separate queue controls. Imagine you wanted to create a show where you have the dunes in red, green and blue versions and the line patterns in red, green and blue versions. If you were using scenes, you would do the following. But with queues, you might create a queue that stores the media, one for dunes and one for lines. Then you might create three cues for red, green and blue surface colours. We can duplicate a cue by alt dragging it to a new space on the grid. Remember, in edit mode I have to shift click to change these values and store them in the cue. So now we can change the color of the media with the same three cues. This is a more efficient and flexible way of working and allows for finer control of your show. 
Let's assume you have a collection of animations that your client has selected for the cake and you want them to play in a certain order and loop. You've imported the animations so that they are accessible over here in Movies. Select all your surfaces and create a new queue for each material by dragging them down onto the queue grid. Rename them to stay organised and colour code them if that helps you. Do this for each animation. Select all the surfaces, assign an animation to them, then drag the surfaces down to an empty grid space. Ensure, if any movie is playing, switch when a movie loop finishes is selected in your autoplay settings and that you have set the loop behaviour you want. Hit autoplay and your show is up and running. You can always use this icon to skip to the next queue if you want to move on before the video has finished playing. You can reorder the queues by dragging and dropping a queue on top of another to make them switch places. Imagine you have a particle cascade and you want to be able to trigger a colour change and then trigger a fade out. Again, let's assume you've already set up all your surfaces and done your mapping. Select all the surfaces and drag them into a new queue. With all the surfaces selected, in edit mode, create a new queue that stores a pink colour value in the surface parameters by holding down shift and pulling down the green slider. Then we create another queue, again with all the surfaces selected, and store the opacity parameter inside. With shift click, slide it to zero. If we skip to the different columns, we can see we've set up the states we want. Now to set some transition behavior. Maybe fade over three seconds for the color shift and over six for the fade out. Set up in this way, if we autoplay, at the point where you want the colour change to occur, trigger the next button at the top of the cue bank. Click again to trigger the fade out. Now for our final test case example. I'll save our current arrangement as a scene over here to use later. Imagine you set up your surfaces in this manner to take full advantage of your projector's resolution. I talk about this workflow in other videos if you are interested in learning more. But perhaps you have another piece of content and you haven't been able to prepare it to fit this workflow. Maybe at the wedding a client gives you a photograph on a USB and asks you to put it on the cake. Your surfaces set up like this clearly aren't going to work. Save this as a scene. Now you can change your input surfaces to something that's going to work, namely the arrangement we had earlier. So let's trigger our old scene to bring it back. Save it as a scene in column 2. Select all the surfaces and assign them the client's photo, which now looks much better. However, I want to scale it a bit to include more of the photo. These surfaces are perfectly set up to fit the firework animations, so I don't want to scale the input surfaces and mess that up. So I'll update the scene and keep this as a kind of preset for the fireworks. Then I'll make a new scene specifically for the client's photo, scale the input surfaces and move them until I'm happy with the way the photo is framed and update the scene.
I could now rename the scenes. What I've created is essentially three presets for three different mapping arrangements for three styles of media content. I hope you found this tutorial useful. Please like and subscribe for more projection mapping and cake mapping tutorials and videos.